The Rule of Saint Benedict is a book of precepts written by Saint Benedict of Nursia for monks living communally under the authority of an abbot. The spirit of Saint Benedict's rule is summed up in the motto of the Benedictine Confederation, Pax and the traditional Aura A Labora. Compared to other precepts, the rule provides a moderate path between individual zeal and formulaic institutionalism. Because of this middle ground it has been widely popular. Benedict's concerns were the needs of monks in a community environment, namely, to establish due order, to foster an understanding of the relational nature of human beings, and to provide a spiritual father to support and strengthen the individual's ascetic effort and the spiritual growth that is required for the fulfillment of the human vocation, theosis. The rule of Saint Benedict has been used by Benedictines for fifteen centuries, and thus Saint Benedict is sometimes regarded as the founder of Western monasticism. There is, however, no evidence to suggest that Benedict intended to found a religious order in the modern sense and it was not until the later Middle Ages that mention was made of an order of Saint Benedict. His rule is written as a guide for individual, autonomous communities, and to this day all Benedictine houses remain self-governing. Advantages seen in retaining this unique Benedictine emphasis on autonomy include cultivating models of tightly bonded communities and contemplative lifestyles. Perceived disadvantages comprise geographical isolation from important activities in adjacent communities. Other perceived losses include inefficiency and lack of mobility in the service of others, and insufficient appeal to potential members. These different emphases emerged within the framework of the rule in the course of history and are to some extent present within the Benedictine Confederation and the Cistercian orders of the common in the strict observance. Origins Christian monasticism first appeared in the Eastern Roman Empire a few generations before Benedict of Nursia, in the Egyptian desert. Under the great inspiration of Saint Anthony the Great. Ascetic monks led by St. Pacomius formed the first Christian monastic communities under what became known as an abbot, from the Aramaic abba. Within a generation, both solitary and communal monasticism became very popular and spread outside of Egypt, first to Palestine and the Judean desert and thence to Syria and North Africa. St. Basil of Caesarea codified the precepts for these eastern monasteries in his ascetic rule, or ascetica which is still used today in the Eastern Orthodox Church. In the West in about the year 500, Benedict became so upset by the immorality of society in Rome that he gave up his studies there, at age 14, and chose the life of an ascetic monk in the pursuit of personal holiness, living as a hermit in a cave near the rugged region of Subiaco. In time, setting an example with his zeal, he began to attract disciples. After considerable initial struggles with his first community at Subiaco, he eventually founded the monastery of the Monte Cassino in 529, where he wrote his rule near the end of his life. In Chapter 73, Saint Benedict commends the rule of Saint Basil and alludes to further authorities. He was probably aware of the rule written by Pacomius. And his rule also shows influence by the rule of St. Augustine of Hippo and the writings of St. John Cassian. Benedict's greatest debt, however, may be to the anonymous document known as the Rule of the Master, which Benedict seems to have radically excised, expanded, revised and corrected in the light of his own considerable experience and insight. Overview The rule opens with a hortatory preface, in which St. Benedict sets forth the main principles of the religious life, viz. the renunciation of one's own will and arming oneself with the strong and noble weapons of obedience under the banner of the true King, Christ the Lord. He proposes to establish a school for the Lord's service in which the way to salvation shall be taught, so that by persevering in the monastery till death his disciples may through patience share in the passion of Christ that, they may deserve also to share in his kingdom. Chapter 1 defines four kinds of monks, cenobites, those in a monastery, where they serve under a rule and an abbot. Anchorites, or hermits, who, after long successful training in a monastery, are now coping single-handedly, with only God for their help. Cerebrites, living by twos and threes together or even alone, with no experience, rule and superior, and thus a law unto themselves. And gyravags, wandering from one monastery to another, slaves to their own wills and appetites. 
Chapter 2 describes the necessary qualifications of an abbot, forbids the abbot to make distinctions between persons in the monastery except for particular merit, and warns him he will be answerable for the salvation of the souls in his care. Chapter 3 ordains the calling of the brothers to counsel upon all affairs of importance to the community. Chapter 4 lists 73 tools for good work tools of the spiritual craft for the workshop that is the enclosure of the monastery and the stability in the community. These are essentially the duties of every Christian and are mainly scriptural either in letter or in spirit. Chapter 5 prescribes prompt, ungrudging, and absolute obedience to the superior in all things lawful, unhesitating obedience being called the first degree, or step, of humility. Chapter 6 recommends moderation in the use of speech, but does not enjoin strict silence, nor prohibit profitable or necessary conversation. Chapter 7 divides humility into twelve degrees, or steps in the ladder that leads to heaven, 1. Fear God. Subordinate one's will to the will of God. Be obedient to one's superior. Be patient amid hardships. Confess one's sins. Accept oneself as a worthless workman. Consider oneself inferior to all. Follow examples set by superiors. Do not speak until spoken to. Do not laugh. Speak simply and modestly. And be humble in bodily posture. Chapters 8 to 19 regulate the divine office, the godly work to which nothing is to be preferred, namely the eight canonical hours. Detailed arrangements are made for the number of psalms etc., to be recited in winter and summer, on Sundays, weekdays, holy days, and at other times. Chapter 19 emphasizes the reverence owed to the omnipresent God. Chapter 20 directs that prayer be made with heartfelt compunction rather than many words. It should be prolonged only under the inspiration of divine grace, and in community always kept short and terminated at a sign from the superior. Chapter 21 regulates the appointment of a dean over every ten monks. Chapter 22 regulates the dormitory. Each monk is to have a separate bed and is to sleep in his habit, so as to be ready to rise without delay, for early vigils. A light shall burn in the dormitory throughout the night. Chapters 23 to 29 specify a graduated scale of punishments for contumacy, disobedience, pride, and other grave faults. First, private admonition. Next, public reproof. Then separation from the brothers at meals and elsewhere. And finally excommunication. Chapter 30 directs that a wayward brother who has left the monastery must be received again, if he promises to make amends. But if he leaves again, and again, after the third time all return is finally barred. Chapters 31 and 32 order the appointment of officials to take charge of the goods of the monastery. Chapter 33 forbids the private possession of anything without the leave of the abbot, who is, however, bound to supply all necessities. Chapter 34 prescribes a just distribution of such things. Chapter 35 arranges for the service in the kitchen by all monks in turn. Chapters 36 and 37 address care of the sick, the old, and the young. They are to have certain dispensations from the strict rule, chiefly in the matter of food. Chapter 38 prescribes reading aloud during meals, which duty is to be performed by those who can do so with edification to the rest. Signs are to be used for whatever may be wanted at meals, so that no voice interrupts the reading. The reader eats with the servers after the rest have finished, but he is allowed a little food beforehand in order to lessen the fatigue of reading. Chapters 39 and 40 regulate the quantity and quality of the food. Two meals a day are allowed, with two cooked dishes at each. Each monk is allowed a pound of bread and a hemina of wine. The flesh of four-footed animals is prohibited except for the sick and the weak. Chapter 41 prescribes the hours of the meals, which vary with the time of year. Chapter 42 enjoins the reading an edifying book in the evening, and orders strict silence after Compline. Chapters 43 to 46 define penalties for minor faults, such as coming late to prayer or meals. Chapter 47 requires the abbot to call the brothers to the work of God in choir, and to appoint chanters and readers. Chapter 48 emphasizes the importance of daily manual labor appropriate to the ability of the monk. 
The hours of labor vary with the season but are never less than five hours a day. Chapter 49 recommends some voluntary self-denial for Lent, with the abbot's sanction. Chapters 50 and 51 contain rules for monks working in the fields or traveling. They are directed to join in spirit, as far as possible, with their brothers in the monastery at the regular hours of prayers. Chapter 52 commands that the oratory be used for purposes of devotion only. Chapter 53 deals with hospitality. Guests are to be met with due courtesy by the abbot or his deputy. During their stay they are to be under the special protection of an appointed monk. They are not to associate with the rest of the community except by special permission. Chapter 54 forbids the monks to receive letters or gifts without the abbot's leave. Chapter 55 says clothing is to be adequate and suited to the climate and locality, at the discretion of the abbot. It must be as plain and cheap as is consistent with due economy. Each monk is to have a change of clothes to allow for washing, and when traveling is to have clothes of better quality. Old clothes are to be given to the poor. Chapter 56 directs the abbot to eat with the guests. Chapter 57 enjoins humility on the craftsmen of the monastery, and if their work is for sale, it shall be rather below than above the current trade price. Chapter 58 lays down rules for the admission of new members, which is not to be made too easy. The postulant first spends a short time as a guest. Then he is admitted to the novitiate where his vocation is severely tested. During this time he is always free to leave. If after twelve months probation he perseveres, he may promise before the whole community stabilitate sua a conversation morum sorum a obodientia, stability, conversion of manners, and obedience. With this vow he binds himself for life to the monastery of his profession. Chapter 59 allows the admission of boys to the monastery under certain conditions. Chapter 60 regulates the position of priests who join the community. They are to set an example of humility, and can only exercise their priestly functions by permission of the abbot. Chapter 61 provides for the reception of strange monks as guests, and for their admission to the community. Chapter 62 deals with the ordination of priests from within the monastic community. Chapter 63 lays down that precedence in the community shall be determined by the date of admission, merit of life, or the appointment of the abbot. Chapter 64 orders that the abbot be elected by his monks, and that he be chosen for his charity, zeal, and discretion. Chapter 65 allows the appointment of a provost, or prior, but warns that he is to be entirely subject to the abbot and may be admonished, deposed, or expelled for misconduct. Chapter 66 appoints a porter, and recommends that each monastery be self-contained and avoid intercourse with the outer world. Chapter 67 instructs monks how to behave on a journey. Chapter 68 orders that all cheerfully try to do whatever is commanded, however hard it may seem. Chapter 69 forbids the monks from defending one another. Chapter 70 prohibits them from striking one another. Chapter 71 encourages the brothers to be obedient not only to the abbot and his officials, but also to one another. Chapter 72 briefly exhorts the monks to zeal and fraternal charity. Chapter 73, an epilogue, declares that the rule is not offered as an ideal of perfection, but merely as a means towards godliness, intended chiefly for beginners in the spiritual life. Secular significance Charlemagne had Benedict's rule copied and distributed to encourage monks throughout Western Europe to follow it as a standard. Beyond its religious influences, the rule of Saint Benedict was one of the most important written works to shape medieval Europe, embodying the ideas of a written constitution and the rule of law. It also incorporated a degree of democracy in a non-democratic society, and dignified manual labor. Outline of the Benedictine Life Saint Benedict's model for the monastic life was the family, with the abbot as father and all the monks as brothers. Priesthood was not initially an important part of Benedictine monasticism a Euro monks used the services of their local priest. Because of this, almost all the rule is applicable to communities of women under the authority of an abbess. Saint Benedict's rule organizes the monastic day into regular periods of communal and private prayer, sleep, spiritual reading, and manual labor a euro ut in omnibus glorificata deus, that in all, 
things God may be glorified. In later centuries, intellectual work and teaching took the place of farming, crafts, or other forms of manual labor for many a Euro if not most a Euro Benedictines. Traditionally, the daily life of the Benedictine revolved around the eight canonical hours. The monastic timetable or herarium would begin at midnight with the service, or office, of matins, followed by the morning office of lords at 3 a.m. Before the advent of wax candles in the 14th century, this office was said in the dark or with minimal lighting. And monks were expected to memorize everything. These services could be very long, sometimes lasting till dawn, but usually consisted of a chant, three antiphons, three psalms, and three lessons, along with celebrations of any local saint's days. Afterwards the monks would retire for a few hours of sleep and then rise at 6 a.m. to wash and attend the office of prime. They then gathered in chapter to receive instructions for the day and to attend to any judicial business. Then came private mass or spiritual reading or work until 9 a.m. when the office of terse was said, and then high mass. At noon came the office of sext and the midday meal. After a brief period of communal recreation, the monk could retire to rest until the office of nun at 3 p.m. This was followed by farming and housekeeping work until after twilight, the evening prayer of Vespers at 6 p.m., then the night prayer of Compline at 9 p.m., and off to blessed bed before beginning the cycle again. In modern times, this timetable is often changed to accommodate any apostolate outside the monastic enclosure. Many Benedictine houses have a number of oblates who were affiliated with them in prayer, having made a formal private promise to follow the rule of Saint Benedict in their private life as closely as their individual circumstances and prior commitments permit. In recent years discussions have occasionally been held concerning the applicability of the principles and spirit of the rule of Saint Benedict to the secular working environment. Reforms, during the more than 1500 years of their existence, the Benedictines have not been immune to periods of laxity and decline, often following periods of greater prosperity and an attendant relaxing of discipline. In such times, dynamic Benedictines have often led reform movements to return to a stricter observance of both the letter and spirit of the rule of Saint Benedict, at least as they understood it. Examples include the Camaldulus, the Cistercians, the Trappists, and the Silverstrines. At the heart of reform movements, past and present, lie hermeneutical questions about what fidelity to tradition means. For example, are sixth-century objectives, like blending in with contemporary dress or providing service to visitors, better served or compromised by retaining sixth-century clothing or by insisting that service excludes formal educational enterprises? Popular legend, a popular legend claims that the rule of Saint Benedict contains the following passage, if any pilgrim monk come from distant parts, if with wish as a guest to dwell in the monastery, and will be content with the customs which he finds in the place, and do not perchance by his lavishness disturb the monastery, but is simply content with what he finds, he shall be received, for as long a time as he desires. If, indeed, he find fault with anything, or expose it, reasonably, and with a humility of charity, the abbot shall discuss it prudently lest perchance God had sent, him for this very thing. But if he have been found gossipy and contumacious in the time of his sojourn as guest, not only ought he not to be joined to the body of the monastery, but also it shall be said to him, honestly, that he must depart. If he does not go, let two stout monks, in the name of God, explain the matter to him. The bulk of the passage, with the exception of the portions in italics, is excerpted from a translation of Chapter 61 of Benedict's Rule found in the book Select Historical Documents of the Middle Ages, translated and edited by Ernest Flagg Henderson, and reprinted in 1907 in the Library of Original Sources, Vol. 4, edited by Oliver J. Thatcher. The version above, first published in Hubbard's Little Journeys, omits a part of the passage which enjoins the monastery, given good behavior, to accept the guest as a permanent resident. The words gossipy and contumacious replace the original lavish or vicious. And the words following he must depart were originally lest, by sympathy with him, others also become contaminated. No language corresponding to the last sentence about two stout monks appears in the rule, though it is a popular myth that it does, 
with several reputable publications repeating and propagating the error. At least one of the sources cited attributes the passage to a mythical chapter 74. The rule of Saint Benedict contains only 73 chapters. An early source for the quotation is the University of California, Berkeley Faculty Club, which has, for years, posted a version of the above passage on its bulletin board in Gothic script. According to another urban legend, the Benedictine motto is supposedly Aura est labora, which would mean, to say pray. Equals, saying work. The actual motto, however, is, Aura a labora meaning pray and work, which refers to two major components of a monastic life, first prayer and then work to support the community and its charities. See also, Rule of Saint Augustine, Rule of Saint Basil, Columban Rule, Rule of the Master, Rule of Saint Albert, Latin Rule. References This article incorporates text from a publication now in the public domain, Herbermann, Charles, ed. Rule of Saint Benedict. Catholic Encyclopedia. Robert Appleton Company. R. W. Southern, Western Society and the Church in the Middle Ages. Pelican, 1970, Henry Mayer Harting, The Venerable Bede, The Rule of Saint Benedict, and Social Class. Jarrow Lecture 1976. Jarrow, Rector of Jarrow, 1976. ISBN 0-903495-03-1, Christopher Derrick, The Rule of Peace, St. Benedict and the European Future. Still River, Mass St. Bede's Publications 2002. ISBN 978-0-932506-01-6, Abbott. Oxford English Dictionary. Oxford University Press. September 2005. Chambers, Mortimer. The Western Experience. Pages 188. ISBN 0-394-31733-5. OSB. About the Rule of St. Benedict by Abbot Primate Jerome Thyssen OSB. Retrieved November 10, 2008. Hubbard, Albert. Little Journeys to the Homes of Great Teachers. Pages 102. Bible.org, Sermon Illustrations. Retrieved November 10, 2008. Sermon Illustrations. Retrieved November 10, 2008. The Benedictine Oblate Newsletter. Archived from the original on July 20, 2008. Retrieved November 10, 2008. The Faculty Club Newsletter, October 2002. Retrieved November 10, 2008. Work is Prayer, Not. By Terence Cardong from Assumption Abbey Newsletter. Volume 23, Number 4 Inches. Retrieved July 7, 2010. External links, St. Benedicta Euro Unregistered Trademark S. Rule for Monasteries at Project Gutenberg, translated by Leonard J. Doyle, The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, translated by Boniface Bahian, online scanned images of complete late 10th or early 11th century copy of the Rule of St. Benedict in Latin, an introduction to the rule by Jerome Thyssen, former abbot primate of the Benedictine Confederation, the Rule of St. Benedict in Latin.